Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. The following is part four in a series of talks I've given covering the book, The Conquest of New Spain by Bernal Diaz de Castillo. Uh, the book was written in the early 16th century by a soldier who was involved in the conquest of Spain with Hernan Cortez. And the last section, part three, we covered the, uh, the Spaniards' reception in the head city of the Aztecs. The narrative picks up with the arrival of an additional Spanish force that numbered in the over a thousand men with orders to arrest Hernan Cortes. So I pick up the narrative here. Quote, the Bishop of Burgos, who was at that time president of the Indies, bore unlimited sway in that department during the absence of the emperor in Flanders. He now sent out orders to Velazquez to seize and make us prisoners at all events, in consequence of which the governor of Cuba fitted out a fleet of 19 ships and embarked therein an army of 1,000 400 soldiers and 20 pieces of cannon with all necessary ammunition and appointments, 80 cavalry and 160 muskets and crossbows, the whole being under the command of Pamphilo de Narvez. Such were his exertions and his animosity against Cortes and us that he went for these purposes a journey of about 70 leagues from the Havana. While he was thus occupied, it appears that the court of royal audience of St. Domingo and the brethren of the order of Geronimites got intelligence thereof. They, knowing our good intentions and great exertions for the service of God and his majesty, and considering how injurious to the entrance thereof the mediated expedition of Velazquez was likely to be, sent the order Lucas Vazquez de Ayon to Cuba with orders to put up a positive stop to the sailing of it. But whatever orders, opposition, and menaces he could make use of for the purposes purpose that were of no avail, Velazquez, confident of the support of the Bishop of Burgos, and having also expended all his property in the equipment, was more bent on it than ever, and held the Oidor and his authorities in defiance. When the old Oidor therefore saw that his endeavors to prevent the armament from sailing were in vain, he thought it most prudent under all the circumstances to embark with it, in order to mediate and prevent any injury to the public service, or, if necessary, by virtue of his office as Oidor, to take possession of the country in the name of his majesty the emperor. The fleet fitted out by Velazquez and under the command of Narvez arrived at the port of St. Juan de Ulua without any accident except the loss of one small vessel. The whole composed a formidable and respectable force considering that it was entirely created in the island of Cuba. On its arrival, the soldiers who had been sent in quest of the mines of that country, as has been before related, went on board, and it is said that on so doing they returned thanks to God for their delivery from the command of Cortes and the dangers of the city of Mexico. Narvaez, finding them so open, ordered that they should be plentifully supplied with wine to render them more communicative, in which he effectually succeeded. Cervantes the jester, under color, color of facetiousness, exposed to him all the discontents of our people relative to the partition of the treasure, and also the quantity that was obtained, giving Narvaez, in many points, much more intelligence than he wished to hear. They also informed him of the bad state of the garrison commanded by Sandoval and Villarica. The news of the arrival of the fleet was soon communicated to Montezuma, who kept his knowledge of it from Cortes, and at the same time ordered liberal, liberal gifts to be presented to Narvez, whereby a private correspondence was opened between them to the disadvantage of the former, of whom Narvez told the king everything that was bad, saying we were all outcasts and robbers, and that the emperor, hearing of our bad conduct, of our having detained the great Montezuma in custody, and sent that force to liberate them and to punish us by putting us all to death. This intelligence gave the king great satisfaction, for from the account of their force, which was accurately represented to him in painting, he thought us lost. He sent more magnificent presents to Narvez and could not conceal the satisfaction which he felt. It was now three days since he had received this intelligence without communicating it to Cortes, who observed and was surprised at the alteration which he perceived in him. At the expiration of that time, however, being from the circumstance of Cortes having paid him two visits in the course of the day, apprehensive of the general having obtained the knowledge of it through some other channel, he told him the news, saying he had just at that moment received it. Cortes demonstrated the greatest joy, and after Montezuma had shown him the representations of it, which had been transmitted to him, whereby Cortes learned all that it was necessary for him to know, he took his leave and communicated to his troops, who instantly got under arms and fired volleys. We soon perceived, however, that Cortes, when by himself, was very pensive, and shortly calling us together, he explained to us the evident destination of this armament, that it was meant against us, and he now, by gifts as well as by promises, as if what we received was his private bounty instead of our fair right, made interest with us to continue firm and steady to him in the contest which was to take place. 
From the representation of our deserters, Narvez was induced to send to the governor of Villarica, demanding of him to surrender his command. He entrusted this business to three persons, Guevara, a man of talents and a clergyman, a relation of Velasquez named Amarga, and one Vergara, a scrivener, who accordingly set out for Villarica. Sandoval had received information of the arrival of an armament, and guessing its object prepared against an attack. He sent off all his invalids to an Indian village at some distance, and having exhorted his soldiers to hand by him, he caused a gibbet to be erected and placed a guard on the road of Sempoal. When the deputation from Narvez arrived at Villarica, they did not meet a person, a person except Indians, for Sandoval had given orders to the Spaniards not to appear and remained at home himself. They were perplexed at how to proceed, but guessing by the appearance of the house that it must be the governor's, after going to Mass, they proceeded thither. On entering, Guevara sainted Sandoval and immediately began a conversation, the purport of which was the great force of Velazquez had sent and the expense he had been at for the purpose of arresting Cortez and all with him as traitors. And he concluded by summoning Sandoval to surrender himself and his post to General Pamphilo de Narvez. The expressions used by this churchman greatly displeased Sandoval, who told him that if it was not for the protection of his holy profession afforded him, he should be punished for, punished for his insolence and using the word traitors to those who are more faithful subjects to his majesty than either Narvez or Velazquez. And as to his demands, he referred him to Cortes, telling him to go to Mexico and settle his business with him there. Guevara, insisting on executing his mission, called to the notary Vergara to take out his authorities, which he was preparing to do. But Sandoval stopped him, saying, Look, you, Vergara, your papers are nothing to me. I know not if they are true or false originals or copies, but I forbid you to read them here. And by heaven, if you attempt it, I will this instant give you a hundred lashes. At this, Guevara cried out, Why do you mind these traitors? Read the commission. Sandoval, then calling him a lying knave, ordered them all to be seized, whereupon a number of Indians who were employed to work about the fortress, having been prepared for the purpose, threw trammels over them like so many damned souls, making them fast, instantly set off with them on their backs for Mexico. They hardly knowing if they were dead or alive, or for it was not all enchantment, when they traveled in such a manner, post-haste, by fresh relays of Indians, which were in waiting, and saw the large and populous towns, which they paled through with a vapidity that stupefied them. Thus they were carried day and night till they re were safely deposited in Mexico. Sandoval sent to conduct them Pedro de Solis, now sur surnamed de Atras la Puerta, by whom he wrote a line in haste to Cortes informing him of the particulars. As soon as the general got intelligence of their arrival, he ordered us out under arms and received them with the greatest honor, loosening from them their trammels and, and apologizing for the rudeness of his officer, whom he highly blamed. He gave them the most hospitable entertainment and treated them with the greatest respect. And having pretty well lined their pockets with gold, he in a few days sent back, as tractable as lambs, those who had set out against him like furious lions. As our general was one of those whose resources are never exhausted, so also it is hardly necessary to dwell upon the merits of those valiant officers and soldiers who accompanied him, and by our valor, valor in the field and wisdom in council, supported him through all his difficulties. On this occasion it was determined by us as most expedient to send letters to Narvez and others, which had come to hand previous to the arrival of Guevara. In this we most earnestly requested that no step might be taken which would endanger our general interest or encourage the Indians to rise upon us. And we also held out every inducement that friendship or interest could suggest to bring them over to us. At that same time, under those general officers' offers of kindness, we did not forget secretly to treat with such as we thought likely to be wrought upon, for Guevara and Vergara had both informed Cortes that Narvez was not well with his captains, and that gold would do wonders with them. Cortes adjured anything to liberate Montezuma, whose disposition had also, also greatly altered since the time that Narvez had begun to correspond with him, adding that he was convinced that what was alleged to have been said by, by him never could have come from so wise a man, but was the fabrication of such wretches as Cervantes, the buffoon, and others, who had milled and misrepresented him. He at the same time offered an unlimited submission to whatever Narvez would order. Cortes also determined to write the secretary Andres de Duero, and Oidor Lucas Vazquez, and took care that letter should be well accompanied with presents. When Narvez received the letter, he turned it to ridicule, handing it about among his officers, calling us traitors, and saying that he would put us all to death. And as to Cortes, he would cut off his ears and broil and eat them, with a great deal of such absurdity. Of course, he sent no reply what, whatever. Just at this time, Guevara and his associates arrived, and they immediately launched out in the praises of Cortes, declaring the expressions of respect he had made use relative to Narvez, the services that he had rendered, and the advantages that would result from a junction of their forces. This put Narvez in such a rage that he would neither see nor hear any of them again. They then began to converse with their comrades, and when the latter perceived how well furnished they had returned, 
they already wished themselves among us. At this time also arrived the Reverend Father of the Order of Mercy, and brought with him the private letters and presents. He went first to kiss the hands of Narvez, to tell him how anxious Cortez was to serve under his, under his command. But Narvez would not see him, except to revile and abuse him. The Reverend Father therefore gave up all, that part of his commission, and applied himself to the dis distribution of the presents, with such effect that in a short time all the principal officers of the army Narvez, of Narvez were in our interests. If the Odor was originally inclined to favor Cortez, he was now much more so in line he saw the magnificent presence which had been so liberally distributed. This was strongly contrasted by the miserable avarice of Narvez, who used to say in his lofty tones to his major domo, Take heed that not a mantle is missing, as I have duly entered down every article. This penuriousness put his officers in an uproar of exclamation against him, all which he attributed to the intrigues of the Odor Vasquez. There was also a difference between them, owing to his not keeping due accounts with the Oidor, as was his duty, relative to the provision sent in by order of Montezuma. And Narvez, being encouraged by the savor and patronage of the Bishop of Burgos, now seized the Oidor, and sent him as a prisoner to the island of Cuba, or Old Spain. And a gentleman of the name of Oblanco, a man of consideration, remonstrating with Narvez upon this, and saying a good deal upon the merits of Cortes and his associates, was also arrested by him and thrown into prison which he took so much to heart that in three days he died. Theodore Vasquez, during the voyage, prevailed on the captain of the ship to land him at St. Domingo, where, waiting for the officers of the royal court of audience and the Geronimite brothers, they were highly offended at the treatment of their officer had received and made complaints upon the subject to his majesty's council in Castile, without any effect, however, owing to the influence of the Bishop of Burgos. The troops sent by Velasquez, now quitting the coast, advanced to St. Paul. The first thing that Narvez did upon his arrival there was to take forcibly from the, the fat cacique all the gold and mantles, and also the young Indian women who had been given to Cortes and his officers by their parents, and had been left in his care on our march to Mexico. The fat cacique complained of him, to him of this, and also the, of the robberies committed by his soldiers, saying that it was otherwise when Cortes and his men were there. Upon which Salvatierra, a very impudent boasting fellow, exclaimed, See what fear these Indians have of this insignificant Cortes? And yet I protest that this man who was so ready with his tongue on all occasions when we came to attack Narvez and his army the most, was the most despicable cowardly wretch I ever beheld. Narvez at this time transmitted a copy of the commission which he held under the government of Cuba, the farther particulars relative to which I will mention in their place. Our general received constant intelligence of whatever occurred from his friends in the army of Narvez and also from Sandoval, who now informed him that he entertained five persons of consideration who had quitted Narvez, assigning as for a reason for it, that when they saw he did not respect his majesty's oidor, still less had they any hopes of good treatment from him, being the oidor's relations. From these persons he had got information of the resolution of Narvez to come immediately to seek us out in Mexico. This being made known to such of us as Cortez was in the habit of advising with, he agreed with us in, general, in a general determination to march against Narvez and his forces, leaving Alvarado in command of the city. With him remained all those who were not inclined to go with us, and also those we thought would be better from us as having an inclination towards Narvez or Velazquez. We also left a sufficiency of provisions, which was the more necessary as the harvest had been deficient owing to a want of rain. We strengthened our quarters by a good palisade, leaving 83 soldiers with four large guns, 24 muskets, crossbows, and seven horses to keep in awe the populous city of Mexico. Cortes, having waited on Montezuma previous to our march, the king questioned him relative to his intention of marching against Narvez, both being of the same country and vassals of the same monarch. He also requested to know if he could be of any service, expelling his apprehension from what he had heard of their superior numbers. And he also asked of Cortes an explanation relative to the charges brought by the newcomers against him and us, who were outcasts and traitors, and that the others were, were sent to bring us to punishment. Cortes cheerfully replied that he had not before spoken to him on the subject of his departure because he was convinced it would give his majesty concern that it was true we were all vassals of the fame, same monarch, but utterly false that we were traitors and fugitives. For on the contrary, we had come fully authorized. That as for their destroying us by, the superior, by their superior numbers, it did not depend upon them, but upon our Lord Jesus Christ and his blessed mother, who would support us. And he also added that as our monarch ruled many different countries, the inhabitants of them were more brave than those of the others. And we were all natives of old Castile, called true Castilians, whereas our opponents were commanded by a Biscayan, and that his majesty should soon see the difference between us, as he hoped with the blessing of God to bring them back with him prisoners, and that our going should, be not therefore give, should not therefore give his majesty any uneasiness. 
He also expressed his hope that Montezuma would, in his, would to his utmost endeavor, prevent any insurrection in the city, as he would certainly would, on his return, make those who behaved ill in his absence dearly answer for it. Cortes then took his leave, embracing Montezuma twice, which the king returned, and Donna Marina acquitted herself so well in her office that she made the separation a very melancholy one. Montezuma pro promised to do all that Cortes desired of him, and offered to assist him with the 5,000 troops, an offer which Cortes, knowing indeed that he had not to send that he had them not to send, declined by saying that he required no aid but that of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he requested that the king would cause due attention be given to that part of the temple which was consecrated but to our holy religion. Having parted from Montezuma, he summoned Alvarado and the garrison of Mexico, and addressing them in a body, charged them to watch well and not suffer the king to escape from them, promising at his return that if they did their duty properly to make them all rich. The clergyman Juan Diaz and certain other suspected persons, persons he left with Alvarado. We then set out on our march by the city of Cholula, from whence we sent to the chiefs of the Tlaxcalans, requiring them to assist us with a force of 4,000 warriors. They replied that if it was against Indians, they were very ready to go, but if it against our countrymen, they begged to be excused. They sent us, however, 20 loads of fowls. Cortes also wrote to Sandoval to join him with all his force at a place called Tampanqueta, or Miltalquita, 12 leagues from Semperal. We marched without baggage, in regular order, with two confidential men, foot soldiers, a day's journey before us. They did not keep the direct road, but went by those where cavalry could not pass, inquiring for intelligence concerning the army of Narvez. When we had proceeded some distance upon our march, one of our advanced parties met with four Spaniards, who turned out to be those of Narvez, with the proofs of his commission of Captain General. On our coming to where they were, they saluted Cortes with great respect, and he immediately dismounted in order to confer with them. I'm skipping forward a little bit to discuss the encounter of Cortes with the Spaniards under Narvez. Having thus arranged his troops and instructed his captains, he addressed us in a few words, saying he well knew that the army of Narvez was four times more numerous than ours, but that they were not accustomed to arms, and many of them were ill. He therefore trusted that, attacking them thus unexpectedly, God would give the victory to us, who were his faithful, faithful servants, and that next to divine assistance we were to rely on our own courage and the strength of our arms, and that was the hour of trial, and that at worst it was preferable to die with glory. One circumstance has struck me since, which is, that he never once said or insinuated to us that such or such persons in the army of Narvez were our friends, and in so doing he acted like a wise captain, making us rely entirely on our own exertions and use them to the utmost, without expecting any other assistance or support. Our three detachments were now formed, and the captains at the head of each, they and the soldiers mutually encouraging each other. Our captain, Pizarro, explained to us, how we were to rush in upon the guns with our lances at the charge, and that immediately on getting them in our possession, the artillery men who were attached to his company should point and fire them against the quarters of Narvez. What we would not have given for defensive armor on this night, a morion, a helmet, or a breastplate would have fetched any money. Our counter sign was Spiritu Santo, Spiritu Santo. That of Narvez was Santa Maria, Santa Maria. As Captain Sandoval and I were always intimate friends, he at this time called me aside and made me promise to him that after the capture of the guns, if I remained alive, I would seek out and attach myself to him for the rest of the engagement. These things being arranged, we remained with empty stomachs, reflecting on what was before us and waiting for the orders to march. I was stationed, stationed sentinel at an advanced post and had not been there long when a patrol came to me and asked me if I had heard anything. I replied that I had not. A corporal soon came after to our post and said that Gaia Gio, the deserter of Narvez's army, was missing and that he had come amongst us as a spy in consequence of which Cortes had given orders that we should march instantly. Accordingly, we heard our drum beat and the captains calling over their companies. We joined the column, and proceeding on our march, we found the soldier whom we had missed, sleeping in the road under some mantles, for the poor, poor, poor fellow, not being inured to hardships, was fatigued. We continued our march at a quick pace and in profound silence, and soon arrived at the river, where we surprised two vedettes of the army of Narvez, one of whom, by the name of Carrasco, we made prisoner, the other flying before us into the town and giving the alarm. On account of the rain, we found the river deeper than usual and difficult to pass, owing to the loose stones under our feet and the weight of our arms. I also rec recollect that the soldier whom we had made prisoner called to our general, Senor Cortez, do not advance, for I swear that Narvez is with his whole force drawn up to receive you. Cortez gave him in charge to his secretary, Hernandez, and we proceeded. And on coming into the town, heard the man who had escaped giving the alarm, and Narvez calling his captains to turn out. Our company, which headed the column, charging our lances, rushed on, and closing up to the guns, 
made ourselves mailers of them without giving the artillerymen time to put the matches to more than four, one of which shot only took effect, killing three of our soldiers. Our whole force now advanced with drum beating and falling upon the cavalry brought down six or seven of them, whilst we who had got possession, possession of the guns could not quit them because the enemy kept up a heavy discharge of arrows and musketry from the quarters of Narvez. Captain de Sandoval and his company coming forward marched up the steps of the, steps of the temple, notwithstanding that he was stoutly resisted by the enemy with missile weapons, musketry, partisans, and lances. And then, who we who were in charge of the artillery, perceiving that there was no longer any danger to them, left them to our gunners and proceeded with Captain Pizarro to support the attack of Sandoval, who had been forced down six or seven of the steps. Supported by us, they again advanced, making the enemy give ground in their turn. And at just that instant, if I do not mistake, I heard the voice of Narvez crying out, Santa Maria, assist me, for they have killed me, struck out one of my eyes. On this, we all shouted, victory, victory, for the Espiritu Santo, Narvez is dead. Still, we could not force our way into the temple until Martin Lopez, the shipwright, a very tall man, set fire to the thatch of the roof, and the fire spreading forced those who were inside to rush out and come tumbling down the steps. Sanchez Farfan was the first who laid his hand on Narvez. We brought him prisoners to Sandoval, together with the several of his captains, and continued shouting, victory, Live our king in Cortez. Narvez is dead. During this time, Cortez and the rest of our army were engaged with those of the troops Narvez had, who had yet held out in some lofty temples, which we now battered with the artillery. As soon as our shouts were understood in the cause of them, Cortez made proclamation that all who did not instantly submit and range themselves under the standards of his majesty and the command of his officer Cortez should be put to death. This, however, had no effect on those who occupied the lofty temples where Diego Velazquez and Salvatierra were posted until Sandoval, with one half of our body and the guns, proceeded against them, and entering, made those officers and the people with them prisoners. As soon as this was done, Sandoval returned to keep the guard upon Narvez, who was doubly ironed. We had also with him, under our care, Salvatierra, Velazquez, Gamara, Juan Yuste, Juan Bono Vizcano, and many other principal persons. Shortly after, Cortez came in unobserved, fatigued, and the sweat running down his face, and addressing Sandoval, without any congratulation or compliment, told him that it was impossible to describe what he had gone through. Then turning about, he cried, What has become of Narvez? How is Narvez? Sandoval answered, He is very safe. Cortez then said, Son Sandoval, keep good watch on him and the other captains. After which he hastened out to cause proclamation to be made that all should immediately lay down their arms or submit. All this passed during the night, showers falling frequently, and the intervals in the moon shone. But just at the moment of our attack, it was extremely dark and rained heavily. In a multitude of fireflies appearing at the same time, the soldiers of Narvez thought they were the lighted masters of our musketry. Narvez was very badly wounded, and his eye was beaten out. He therefore requested that his surgeon named Maestre Juan should be sent for. This being done, whilst he was under the operation of having his eye dressed, Cortez entered the room unnoticed, and being soon observed, Narvez addressed it to him, said, Senor Captain Cortez, appreciate as it deserves your good fortune in having defeated and made me prisoner. Cortez replied that his thanks were due to God and his valiant officers and soldiers but that it was the least of our achievements since our arrival in New Spain, and that for daring he thought the arrest of his majesty's officer much exceeded it. He then quitted the place, and again warning Sandoval to keep good guard. We soon after brought Narvez and the rest of the prisoners to another apartment, where guard was placed upon the composed of our most trusty and confidential soldiers. To this duty I was appointed, and Sandoval, before he left, called me aside and gave me a private order to permit no person whatsoever to speak to Narvez. We knew that forty of the cavalry were at an outpost up the river, it was therefore necessary to keep a good guard until this party was disposed of, lest they should fall upon us in order to rescue their officers. Cortez now sent them to Cristobal de Oli and de Ordas, mounted on two of the horses of Narvez, which we found tied in a small wood close to Semperol, with unlimited offers if they would come in and submit. Our officer, officers, guided by one of Narvez's soldiers, arrived at the port of the cavalry, and by their promises and arguments won them over, and they all entered the town together. By this time it was dear day. Cortez seated in an armchair, a mantle of orange color thrown over his shoulders, his arms by his side, and surrounded by his officers and soldiers, received the salutations of the cavaliers, who, they dismounted, who as they dismounted came up to kiss, him, kiss his hand. It was a wonderful to see the affability and the kindness with which he spoke to and embraced them, and the compliments he made to them. Amongst the number were Augustin Bermudez, André de Duero, and many other friends of our general. Each, as he paid his respects, took his leave and went to the quarters assigned him. During all this time, and even before the arrival of the cavalry, the drums, fifes, and timbals of the army of Narvez never ceased, having struck up at daybreak in honor of Cortez without being desired or spoken to by any one of us. One of them, a negro and a comical fellow, danced and shouted for joy, crying, 
Where are the Romans who with such small numbers have ever achieved such a glorious victory? Nor was it possible to silence him or the rest until Cortes was at last obliged to order one of them to be confined. Our losses on each side of this occasion were as follows. The ensign of Narvez named Fortes and Hilgaldo of Sevilla, a captain of the same Ardi named Rojas of Old Castile, and two others killed and many wounded. One also of the three who had antecedently deserted from us was killed. Four of our soldiers were killed and a number wounded. The fat cacique on our approach had taken refuge in the quarters of Narvez. He also received a wound. Cortez ordered him to his house and to be there protected and Kate taken care of. Of the two others who deserted, deserted from us, each got his deserts, Escalona being severely wounded and Cervantes well beaten. As to the fierce Salvatierra, his soldiers declared that they never saw so pitiful a fellow or so ter terrified a being when he heard our drumbeat. But when we shouted for victory and cried that Narvez was dead, he told them that he had got a pain in his stomach and could fight no more. Such was the result of his bravados. Captain Velasquez de Leon and his relation Diego Velasquez to his own quarters, where he had his wounds attended to and treated him with the utmost distinction. The reinforcement of the wars of Chin Ananta, which Cortes had been promised, marched in shortly after the action was over, conducted by our soldier Barrientos, with great pomp and regularity, in two files, lanciers and archers alternately. And in this manner they came to the number of 1,500, with colors, drums, and trumpets, shouting and making such a warlike appearance that it was glorious to behold. It afforded mat a matter of astonishment to the army of Narvez, for they appeared to be double their real number. Our general received them with infinite courtesy and dismissed them with thanks and handsome presents. Cortes now sent Francisco de Lugo to order all the captains and pilots of the fleet to come to him at Sempoal, and in case they refused to make them prisoners. He also gave directions that the ships should be dismantled, thereby cutting off all possibility of a communication with Cuba. Narvez had con confined one Barahona, a rich man, and afterwards an inhabitant, an inhabitant of Guatemala. Him Cortes to be immediately released and kindly treated. I recollect when he joined us, he appeared in a very weak and languid state. The captains and pilots of the fleet immediately came to pay their respects to our general. He made them take an oath that they would not separate from him, and they would obey his orders, and appointed one of them, Pedro Cavallero, his admirable, admiral of the whole fleet. Cortes warned him that if, as he expected, more vessels arrived from Cuba, he should immediately dismantle them and send the captains and pilots to the headquarters. Having thus secured his port, he turned to other matters and ordered Velasquez de Leon with 120 men upon an expedition to Panuco. 100 of them were soldiers who had come with Narvez. The other 20 were taken from amongst ourselves. This force was also to have two ships with it for the purpose of extending our discoveries. He gave a command upon a similar plan to Diego de Ordas to establish a colony at Guacahualco. Ordas was also sent to Jamaica for horses and stock to establish an independent supply in the country, the province he went to being well adapted for breeding, breeding cattle. Cortes commanded all the prisoners to be released except Narvez and Salvatierra, who still complained of the pain in his stomach. He also ordered all the ar horses and arms which had been taken from the soldiers of Narvez to be returned to them, and thus gave our people much content, discontent. But since the general would have it so, we were obliged to submit, and I, for my part, was obliged to surrender a good horse, which I had put in a safe place with a saddle and bridle, two swords, three poignards, and a shield. Hereupon, Captain Alonso de Avila and also our Reverend Father Olmeda took an opportunity of speaking to Cortes and told him they believed he had a mind to imitate Alexander of Macedonia, who after his army had achieved an inglorious action, was more generous to the vanquished than to the conquerors, for that it was observed that all the gold and valuable presents, as fast as he had received them, he gave to the captains of the other army, quite appearing to forget us, which was not well done on his part, we having told, made him what he was. To this, Cortes replied by protesting that he and all he he had was entirely at our service, and he would prove it by his future conduct, but that what he did was unavoidable for our common interest, we being so few and the others so many. Avila, in, this, in answer to this, used some expressions of a rather lofty kind, upon which Cortes observed that whoever did not wish to, wish to follow him might depart, and that the women in Castile had bred good soldiers and would continue to do so. Avila answered again in a still more bold and imperious manner, as Cortes could not at that time break with him. He was forced to dissimulate, knowing him to be a brave and determined man. He therefore pacified him with presence, for he always apprehended some act of violence on his part, and for the future took him care to employ him on a business of importance at a distance, as in the island of San Domingo and afterwards in Old Spain. Narvaez brought with him a Negro who was in the smallpox, an unfortunate importation for that country, for the disease spread with inconceivable rapidity, and the Indians died by the thousands. For not knowing the nature of it, they brought it to a fatal issue by throwing themselves into cold water in the heat of the disorder. 
Thus black was the arrival of Narvez, and blacker still the death of such multitudes of unfortunate souls who were sent into the other world without having an opportunity of being admitted into the bosom of our holy church. At this time a claim was made on Cortez by such of our soldiers as had been in distant garrisons for their share of the gold taken in Mexico. He, as well as I recollect, referred them to a place in Tlaxcala, desiring that two persons might be sent thither to receive it. I will at a future period relate what happened hereupon, but I must at the present revert to other things. The wheel of fortune making sudden turns, evil follows closely upon good, as was our case at present. Our late success is being contrasted by melancholy news from Mexico. We now received intelligence by express from that city, whereby we were informed that an insurrection had broken out and that Alvarado was besieged in his quarters, and that they had set on fire, having killed seven of his men and wounded many, for which reason he earnestly called for succor and support. When we received this news, God knows how, to, how it afflicted us. We set out by long marches for Mexico, leaving Narvez and Salvatierra prisoners in Villa Rica, under the custody of Rodrigo Ranjo, who also had directions to collect all the stragglers and to take care of the invalids, of whom there were many. At the moment we were ready to march, arrived four principal noblemen from the court of Montezuma, to lodge a formal complaint against Alvarado for having assaulted them when dancing at a solemn fester, festival in honor of their gods, which he had permitted them to hold, whereby, in their own defense, they had been forced to kill seven of his soldiers. Cortes replied that to them in terms of not the most pleasing, saying he would soon be at Mexico to put all in proper regulation, with which the answer they returned very little indeed to the satisfaction of Montezuma, who felt the insult strongly, many of the natives being killed. In consequence of this intelligence, detachments were countermanded, and Cortes exhorted the troops of Narvez to forget past animosities, and not to lose this opportunity of serving his majesty and themselves, exposing to their view the riches they would acquire, so that they one and all declare their readiness to proceed to Mexico, a resolution they never would have taken if they had known the force of that city. By very long marches we were arrived at Tlaxcala, where we learned that until the time that Montezuma and the Mexicans got intel intelligence of the defeat of Narvez, they had never ceased making attacks upon Alvarado, but when they heard of our success, they desisted, leaving the Spaniards greatly fatigued and distressed by their continual exertions and want of water and provisions. This information was conveyed by two Indian messengers who arrived at the moment we entered Tlaxcala. Here Cortes made an inspection of our army, which now amounted to 1,300 men, nearly 100 of whom were cavalry, and 160 were crossbowmen and musketeers. 2,000 warriors of the Tlaxcans having joined us, we pursued our route by long marches to Tezcuco, where we were very ill-received, and everything bore the appearance of disaffection. On St. John's Day in the month of June, 1,520, we arrived in the city of Mexico, meeting with a reception very different from our former one, for none of the nobility or chiefs or our acquaintance could be recognized, and the city seemed to be totally depopulated. When we entered our quarters, Montezuma came to embrace Cortez, and with him joy of his victory, but the general would neither hear nor speak to him, whereon the king retired very melancholy to his apartment. Cortes made inquiry into the circumstances of the commotion, which evidently was not approved or instigated by Montezuma. Indeed, if he had thought fit to, to against our party, they could all have been destroyed as easily as seven of them. By what Alvarado told, told Cortes, it appeared that a number of Indians, enraged at the detention of Montezuma, at the erection of the crucifix in their temple, and by the order of their gods, as they said, had gone thither to pull it down, but to their infinite astonishment found all their strength utterly unable to move it. This being represented to Montezuma, he desired no attempt of the kind should be made again. Alvarado added for his own exculpation that the attack was made upon him by the friends and subjects of Montezuma in order to liberate their monarch at the time they believed Narvez had destroyed Cortes and his army. Cortes now asked Alvarado for what reason he fell upon the Mexicans while they were dancing and holding a festival in honor of their gods. To this, Alvarado replied that it was an order to be beforehand with them, having had intelligence of their hostile intentions against him from two of their own nobility and a priest. Cortes then asked him if it was true that they had requested permission of him to hold their festival, and the other hereupon replied that it was so, and that it was in order to take them by surprise and to punish and terrify them, so as to prevent them making war upon the Spaniards, that he had determined to fall on them by anticipation. At hearing this avowal, Cortes was highly enraged, and censured the conduct of Alvarado in the strongest terms, and let, in this temper left him. Alvarado farther said that one time when he was attacked by the Mexicans, he endeavored to fire off one of his guns and could not get the priming to light. But some time after, when they were in very great danger, and expected all to have been killed, the peace went off itself and made such havoc amongst the enemy that they were completely driven back, and the Spaniards thus miraculously saved. 
I heard several other soldiers also mention this as a fact, and it was also said by Alvarado only that when the garrison was in great want of water, they sank a pit in the court, and immediately a spring of the sweetest water broke forth. I can declare to my own knowledge that there was a spring in the city which was free, very frequently threw up water tolerably fresh. Glory to God in all of his mercies. Some say it was just avarice that tempted Alvarado to make this attack in order to pillage the Indians of the golden ornaments which they wore at their festival. I never heard any just reasons for the assertion, nor do I believe any such thing, although it was so represented by Father Bartholome de las Casas. But for my part, I am convinced that his intention in falling on them at that time was in order to strike terror into them and prevent their insurrection, according to the saying, that the first attack is half the battle. A very bad plan as it appeared by the result, as, and it is certain that after the affair at the temple, Montezuma did most earnestly desire that they should not attack our people, but the Mexicans were so enraged they could not be restrained. Cortes during our march had exp expatiated to the newcomers upon the power and influence he possessed and the respect to which he was treated in Mexico, and had filled their minds and heightened their expectations with promises and golden hopes. When on his return, therefore, he experienced the coldness and negligence of his reception in Tezuco, and to equal appearances thereof in Mexico, he grew very peevish and irritable. And the officers of Montezuma coming to wait upon him, expressing their wish of the sovereign to see him, Cortes angrily exclaimed, Away with him, the dog! Why does he neglect to supply us? When the captains de Leon, de Oli, and de Lugo heard this expression, they entreated him to be moderate, and reminded him of the former kindness and generosity of the king. But this seemed to irritate Cortes the more, considering it a kind of a censure, and he indignantly said, what compliment am I under to a dog who treated secretly with Narvez, as we see neglects to send provisions? This the captains admitted ought to be done, and Cortez, confident in the great reinforcement of numbers he had obtained, continued a haughty demeanor. He in this manner now addressed the noblemen sent to him by Montezuma, bidding them all to tell their master immediately to cause markets to be held and provisions supplied, and to be beware of the consequences of neglect. These lords very well understood the purport of the injurious expressions which he had used, and on their return informed the king of what had passed. Whether it was from rage at the story told by them, or the consequence of a preconcerted plan to fall upon us, within a quarter of an hour after, a soldier entered our quarters, wounded dangerously and in great hurry, and told us that the whole people were in arms. This man had been sent by Cortez to bring our quarters some Indian ladies, and among them the daughter of Montezuma, whom Cortez, when he marched against Narvez, had left in the care of their relation, the Prince of Tacuba. He was on his return with them when he was attacked by the people, who were assembled in great numbers, and had broken a bridge upon the causeway of Tacuba, and had once had him in their hands and were hurrying him into a canoe to carry him off for sacrifice, but that he extricated himself from them with two dangerous wounds. Cortes, immediately on receiving the intelligence, ordered out a party of 400 men under the command of Captain de Ordaz to go and see what foundation there was for the account given by the soldier and to endeavor, if possible, to pacify the minds of the people. De Ordaz had hardly proceeded the length of half a street when he was attacked by immense numbers of Mexicans in the streets and on the terraces of the houses, who by their first discharge killed eight soldiers on the spot wounded most of the rest, and Dior Ordaz himself in three places. Finding, the, finding it therefore impossible to proceed, he retreated slowly to our quarters, in doing which he lost another good soldier named Lescano, who with a two-handed sword had performed many great feats of great force and valor. Our quarters had been attacked by multitudes at the same moment. They poured in such discharges of missile weapons upon us there that they immediately wounded upwards of forty-six, twelve of whom afterwards died. The streets were so crowded that Dior Ordaz, when he endeavored to reach us, could not proceed and was incessantly attacked in front, in rear, and from the roofs of the houses. Neither our firearms nor our good fighting could prevent, prevent the enemy from closing in upon us for a length of time. However, Diordaz at last forced his way back with the loss of 23 men. The enemy still continued their attacks, but all we had hitherto suffered was nothing which that, to that which succeeded. They set fire to various parts of the buildings which we occupied, thinking to burn us alive or stifle us with the smoke, and we were obliged to stop it by tearing down the building or by throwing earth upon it. All the courts and open spaces of our quarters were covered with their arrows and missile weapons, and in repelling their attacks, repairing the breaches which they had made in the walls, dressing our wounds, and were preparing for ensuing engagements we paired that day and night. As soon as the next morning dawned, we sallied out with our whole force upon the enemy, being determined as we could not conquer to make them fear us. The Mexicans came to meet us with their whole force, and both parties fought desperately, but as the numbers of our opponents were so immense, and as they constantly brought up fresh troops, even if we had 10,000 hectares of Troy and as many Roldans, we could not have beaten them off. Nor can I give in any idea of the desperation of this battle, for in every charge we made upon them, we brought down 30, even 40. It was of no avail. They came on even with more spirit than the first, 
nor could we, by our cannon and firearms, make any impression upon them. If at any time they appeared to give ground, it was only to draw us from our quarters in order to ensure our destruction. Then the stones and darts thrown on us from the terraces of the houses were intolerable. But I describe it fairly, faintly, for some of our soldiers who had been in Italy swore that neither among the Christians or Turks nor the artillery of the King of France had they ever seen such a des desperation as was manifested in the attacks of those Indians. We were at length forced to retreat to our quarters, which we reached with great difficulty. On this day we lost ten or twelve soldiers. All of us who came back were severely wounded. From the period of our return we were occupied in making preparation for a general sally on the next day, but one with four military machines constructed of a very strong timber in the form of towers, and each capable of containing twenty-five men under cover with portholes for their artillery and for the musketeers and crossbowmen. This work occupied us for the space of one day, except that we were obliged likewise to repair the breaches made in our walls and resist those who attempted to scale them in twenty different places at the same time. They continued their reviling language, saying that the voracious animals of their temples had now been kept two days fasting in order to devour us at the period which was speedily approaching, when they were to sacrifice us to their gods, that our allies were to be put up in cages to fatten, and they would soon repossess our ill-acquired treasure. At other times they plaintively called at us to give them their king, and during the night we were constantly annoyed by showers of arrows, which they accompanied with shouts and whistlings. At daybreak on the ensuing morning, after recommending ourselves to God, we sallied out with our turrets, which as well as I recollect were called burrows or mantas, in other places where I have seen them, with some of our musketry and crossbows in front, and our cavalry occasionally charging. The enemy this, this day showed themselves more determined than ever, and we were equally resolved to force our way to the great temple, although it should cost the life of every man of us. We therefore advanced with our turrets in that direction. I will not detail the desperate battle which we had with the enemy in a very strong house, or how their arrows wounded our horses, notwithstanding their armor. And if at any time the horsemen attempted to pursue the Mexicans, the latter threw themselves into the canals, and others sallied out upon our people and massacred them with large lances. <clears throat> As to the setting fire of the buildings or tearing them down, it was utterly in vain to attempt. They all stood in the water, and only communicating by drawbridges, it was too dangerous to attempt to reach them by swimming, for they showered stones from their slings, and masses of cut stone taken from the buildings upon our heads from the terraces of the houses. Whenever we attempted to set fire to a house, it was an entire day before it took effect, and when it did, the flames could not spread to others, as they were separated from it by the water, and also because the roofs of them were terraces. We at length arrived at the great temple, and immediately and instantly, above 4,000 Mexicans rushed up into it, without including in that number other bodies who occupied it before, and defended it against us with lances, stones, and darts. Thus they prevented our ascending for some time, neither turrets nor musketry nor cavalry availing, for although the latter body several times attempted to charge, the pavement of the courts of the temple was so smooth that the houses could not keep their feet and fell. The horses could not keep their feet and fell. From the steps of the great temple they opposed us in front, and we were attacked by numbers on both sides, that although our guns swept off ten or fifteen of them at each discharge, that in each attack our infantry killed, we killed many with swords, their numbers were such that we could not make any effectual impression or ascend the steps. We were then forced to abandon our turret, which the enemy had destroyed, and with great concert, making an effort without them, we forced our way up. Here Cortez showed himself the man he really was. What a desperate engagement we then had. Every man of us was covered with blood, and above forty dead upon the spot. It was God's will that we should at length reach the place where we had put up the image of Our Lady, for when we came there it was not to be found, and it seems Montezuma, actuated either by fear or by devotion, had caused it to be removed. We set fire to the building, then burnt a part of the temple of the gods Huichlapocli and Tetzcat. Puko. <coughs> here, are, here our Tlaxcan allies served us essentially. While thus engaged, some setting the temple on fire, others fighting above 3,000 Mexican nobles with their priest about us, attacking us, drove us down six or seven of the steps, while others were in the corridors or within side the railings and concavities of the great temple shot, shot such clouds of arrows at us that we could not maintain our ground when thus attacked from every part. We therefore began our retreat, every man of us being wounded and 46 less dead upon the spot. We were pursued with a violence and desperation which is not in my power to describe, nor in that of anyone to form an idea who did not see it. During all this time, also, other bodies of the Mexicans have been continually attacked our quarters and endeavoring to set fire to them. In this battle, we made prisoners two of the principal priests. I have often seen this engagement represented in the paintings of the natives, both of Mexico and Tlaxcala, and our, accent, our, our ascent into the great temple. In these, our party is represented with many dead and all wounded, setting fire to the temple when so many warriors were defending it in the corridors, railings, and concavities, and other bodies of them on the plain ground, and filling the courts and on the sides, and our turrets demolished, 
is considered by them a most heroic action. With great difficulty, we reached our quarters when we found the enemy almost in possession of, as they had beaten down a part of the walls, but they desisted in a great measure from their attacks on our rival, still throwing in upon us showers of arrows, darts, and stones. The knight was employed by us in repairing the breaches and dressing our wounds, burying our dead, and consulting upon future measures. No gleam of hope could now rationally be formed by us, and we were utterly sunk in despair. Those who had come with Narvez showered maledictions, maledictions upon Cortez, nor did they forget Velasquez, by whom they had been induced to quit their comfortable and peaceable habitations in the island of Cuba. <clears throat> it was determined to try, if we could, not procure from the enemy a cessation of hostilities on condition for our quitting the city. But at daybreak they assembled round our quarters and attacked them with greater fury than ever, nor could our firearms repel them, although they did considerable execution. Cortez, perceiving how desperate our situation was, determined that Montezuma should address his subjects from a terrace and desire them to desist from their attacks with an offer from us to evacuate Mexico. He accordingly sent the king to desire him to do so. When this was made known to Montezuma, he, built the, he burst out into violent expressions of grief, saying, What does he want of me now? I neither desire to hear him nor to live any longer, since my unhappy fate has reduced me to this situation of his account, on his account. He therefore dismissed those sent to him with a refusal, adding, as it is said, that he wished not to be troubled any more with the false words and promises of Cortez. Upon this, the Reverend Father Fray Bartholomew and Cristobal de Oli went to him and addressed him with the most affectionate and persuasive language to induce him to appear, to which he replied that he did not believe that his doing so would be of any avail, and that the people had already elected another sovereign and were determined never to pit, want, permit one of us to quit the city alive. The enemy continued, continued in their attacks, and Montezuma was at length persuaded. He accordingly came and stood at the railing of a terraced roof, attended by many of our soldiers, and addressed the people below him, requesting in very affectionate language a cessation of hostilities in order that we might quit the city. The chiefs and nobility, as soon as they perceived him coming forward, called on their troops to desist and be silent, and four of them approached so as to be heard and spoken to by Montezuma. Then they addressed him, lamenting the misfortunes of him, his children and family, and also told him that they had railed Codlavaca, Prince of Itzapalapa, to the throne adding that the war was drawing to a conclusion and that they had promised their gods never to desist, but with the total destruction of the Spaniards, that they every day offered up prayers for his personal safety, and as soon as they had rescued him out of their hands, they would venerate him as before and trusted that he would pardon them. <clears throat> as they concluded their address, a shower of arrows and stones fell about the spot where Montezuma stood, from which the Spaniards, interposing their bucklers, protected the king, but expecting that while speaking to his people they would not make another attack, they unguarded him for an instant, and then just then three stones and an arrow struck him in the head, arm, and leg. The king was thus wounded, refused all assistance, and we were unexpectedly informed of his death. Cortez and our captains wept for him, and he was lamented by them and all the soldiers who had known him as if he had been their father. Nor is it to be wondered at, considering how good he was. It was said that he had reigned 17 years, and that he was the best king Mexico had ever governed by. It was also said that he had fought and conquered in three occasions, and that he had been defied to the field in the progress of subjugating different states of his dominion. Orders were now given to make a portable bridge of very strong timber, to be thrown over the canals where the enemy had broken down the bridges, and for conveying, guarding, and placing this were assigned 150 of our soldiers and 400 of the Allies. By the time all this was arranged, night drew on. Cortez then ordered all the gold which was in his apartment to be brought to the great saloon, which being done, he desired the officers of his majesty in their charge assigning to them for the conveyance of it eight lame and wounded horses, and upwards of eighty Tlaxcalans. Upon these were loaded as much as they could carry of the gold, which had been run into large bars, and much more remained heaped upon the saloon. Cortez then called his sec secretary Hernandez and other royal notaries and said, Bear witness that I can no longer be responsible for this gold. Here is to the value of above six hundred thousand crowns. I can secure no more than what is already packed. Let every soldier take what he will, better so than it should remain for those dogs, the Mexicans. As soon as he had said this, many soldiers, those of Narvez, and also some of ours, fell to work and loaded themselves with treasure. I never was avaricious, and now thought more of saving my life, which was much in danger. However, when the opportunity thus offered, I did not omit seizing out of a casket four Calchihuis, those precious stones so highly esteemed among the Indians. Although Cortez ordered a casket and its contents to be taken care of by his major domo, I luckily secured these jewels in time, and afterwards found them of infinite advantage as a resource against famine. A little before midnight, the detachment, detachment which took charge of the portable bridge let out upon its march, and arriving at the first canal or aperture of water, it was thrown across. The night was dark and misty, and it began to rain. The bridge being fixed, the baggage, artillery, and some of the cavalry passed over it, 
as also the Tlaxcalans with the gold. Sandoval and those with him pass, also Cortez and his party after the first, and many of our soldiers. At this moment, the trumpets and shouts of the enemy were heard, and an alarm was given by them, crying out, Tautuluco, Tautuluco, out with your canoes. The Tules are going. Attack them at the bridges. In an instant, the enemy were upon us by land, and the lake and the canals were covered with canoes. They immediately flew to the bridges and fell on us there, so that they entirely intercepted our line of march. As misfortunes do not come single, it also rained so heavily that some of the horses were terrified, and growing restive fell in the water, and the bridge was broken at the same time. The enemy attacked us here now with redoubled fury, and our soldiers making a stout finance, uh, a stout refinance. The aperture of water was soon filled with the dead and dying men and horses and those struggling, struggling to escape, all heaped together with artillery packs and bales of baggage and those who carried them. Many were drowned here, and many put into canoes and carried off for sacrifice. It was dreadful to hear the cries of the unfortunate sufferers calling for assistance and invoking the Holy Virgin or St. Iago, while others who escaped by swimming or by clambering upon the chest bales of baggage and dead bodies earnestly begged for help to get up the causeway. Many who, on reaching the ground, thought themselves safe, safe were seized or knocked in the head with clubs. Anyway, went whatever regularity had been in the march at first, for Cortez and the captains and soldiers who were mounted, clapped spurs to their horses and galloped off along the causeway. Our wounds, having taken cold and being only bound with rags, were now in a miserable situation and very painful. We also had to deplore the loss of many valiant companions. As for those of Narvez, most of them perished in the water, loaded with gold. Numbers of Tlaxcalans also lost their lives in the same manner. Poor Botello, too, the astrologer. His stars, stars bore an evil aspect, for he was killed with the rest. The sons of Montezuma, Cacamanza, and all the other prisoners, amongst whom were some princes, lost their lives on this fatal night. All our artillery was lost. We had very few crossbows, only 23 horses, and our future prospect was very melancholy. Melancholy from our uncertainty as to the reception we might meet in Tlaxcala, which was our only resource. Oh, what it was to see this tremendous battle, how we were closed foot to foot, and with what fury the dogs fought us, such wounding as there was amongst us with their lances and clubs and two-handed swords, while our cavalry, favored by the plain ground, rode through them at will, galloping at half speed and bearing down their opponents with couched lances, all fighting manfully, although they and their horses were all wounded, and we of the infantry, negligent of our former hurts, and those of which we now received, closed with the enemy, redoubling our efforts to bear them down with our swords. I have the other battles fought by us antecedently to the final conquest. I must now recall to the reader's recollection that our entry into Mexico to relieve Alvarado was on the day of St. John in the month of June, 1520. We entered that city with upwards of 1,300 soldiers, cavalry included, which latter body was 97 in number, and our infantry, 80, were crossbowmen and as many musketeers. We had also with us a great train of artillery and 2,000 Tlaxcan allies. Our flight from Mexico was on the 10th of July following, and the Battle of Alm Tumba was fought on the 14th day of that month. I will now give an account of all of our countrymen who lost their lives in Mexico at the causeway, in battle, and on the road. In five days were killed and sacrificed upwards of 870 soldiers, including 72 of those of Narvez who put to death get together with five Castilian women in the place called Testapeque. 1,200 and upwards of our allies of Tlaxcala were also killed. Juan de Alacantara and two more, who came from the share of the gold assigned to them, were robbed and murdered. And if we examine throughout, we shall find that all who were concerned with the treasure came to ill fortune. Thus it was with the soldiers of Narvez, who perished in a much greater proportion than ours did, on account of their having followed the dictates of their avarice. After the battle, we continued our march to Tlaxcala cheerfully, eating certain gourds named ayotes, which we found by the way, the enemy only shooing themselves at a distance, until we arrived at a village where we took up our quarters in a strong temple and halted for the night, occasionally alarmed by the Mexicans, who kept about us if it were to see us out of their country. From this place, to our great joy, perceived the mountains of Tlaxcala, for we were anxious to be convinced of the fidelity of our friends and to know something of our companions in Villa Rica. Cortez warned us, as we were so few in number and had escaped by God's mercy, to be cautious not to give offense, for we particularly enforced to the soldiers of Narvez who were not so much habituated to discipline. He added that he hoped to find our alley steady to us, but if he turned out to be otherwise, though but 440 strong, ill-armed, and wounded, we had vigorous bodies and stout hearts to carry us through. That's the end of part four. The final part will be part five, where Cortez musters an army, returns to the main city of the Aztecs, and destroys it. Thank you for listening.